Aloha, welcome to the 41st annual Hawaii International Film Festival presented by Halakulani and our discussion with Larissa Berendt, director of Aratika Rise Up. We would like to extend our thanks to the Pacific Islanders in communication who have partnered with us in support of the Pacific Showcase program. This film is also part of our HIF 41 Indigenous Lens program sponsored by Nia Taro. My name is Li Ngo and I am the program associate of the Hawaii International Film Festival. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge the land of Hawaii as an indigenous space whose original people are today identified as Kanaka Maoli or native Hawaiians. Uh, some quick uh, housekeeping bits uh, for up-to-date information on additions to our program and the full schedule of films, events, HIF talk stories, sessions, and Q and A's, please visit our website at www.hif.org. Also to participate in the Hawaii News Now Audience Award voting, please cast your vote via ballot in theaters or online at watch.hif.org, or you can go on our apps by voting with up to five stars on a film's page. Vote for your favorite narrative, documentary, and short film. Mahalo to Hawaii News Now for their support. Larissa, shall we begin the Q&A? Aloha, and I'm coming to you from Gadigal country here in Australia. Love it, wonderful. Uh, I just say I um, truly enjoyed this film. There's so much important uh, history and, and what a great narrative that Aratika Rise Up brings to the Hawaiian International Film Festival. And it focuses on the sport of rugby, right? Um, but it's really not just about rugby. I found out that it's really about people who are looking for a mutual respect within their community. Uh, so what first inspired you to explore this particular narrative? Yeah, thanks. It's a great question because uh, my filmmaking to date has been really around hard social issues, um, uh, criminal justice issues, child removal issues. Um, but I felt actually there was something, as you say, this isn't really a film about football. To me, this was a film about the importance of our cultural connection and the role that sport has played in being part of a national conversation in Australia about a range of things, particularly hard issues around racism. So I'd known Dean, uh, who's the star of, who's become the star of the film, just from you know we're part of the same community, and I knew his work within um, the rugby league um, area because he'd been such a great mentor and really been working with younger Aboriginal men um, coming through and I obviously knew he was a player. And, and it's a sport that a lot of the men in our families have played. So my father, my brother, my male cousins, my uncles all played uh, rugby league. So for us, it's a sport that has a very big communal aspect to it. The biggest uh, community gathering of uh, First Nations people in New South Wales is our weekend um, of knockout um, football, the Koori knockout, which we mention in the film, is actually the time everyone gets together to see family. So it, I always knew it had more to it than just football. Um, and I thought that that story of the evolution of the performance, the cultural performance before the game was going to be a really important story to tell. So when Dean came to me and said, oh, what do you think? Um, by the end of our conversation, I was like, this this is a story we have to tell. I love it. And I love how uh, you've very clearly identified, um, forgive me if I call it rugby, and, and if I'm not actually, <laughs> if it's very, because I know one time a friend, they said that there's a huge distinction between football in Australia and rugby. Uh, so um, I'll try to keep my terms the best, but uh, these sports are such, uh, I mean, in America, there's similar things as well, uh, where like, they are the, the 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 magnet for all of community. They are what brings people together, but it's not just enough to bring people together. It's important to find dignity and equality within that as well, right? Um, but I also wanna talk about, uh, you know, the process of making this film itself. And it goes very far back into a complicated history for both the sport and for uh, racism in Australia. and. And I'm always fascinated when documentarians uh, look into archives and know that mm -hmm. sometimes archives are not as simple as going to, it's going down to you know your, your local library and finding something simple. It's actually a sometimes contentious process. So I'd love to know if, you know, as you were doing your historical explorations, uh, did you encounter any resistance or any challenges to you finding the answers to the questions you had? 
Well, it's such a great question because you've, you know, you've really identified a real challenge in in the First Nations filmmaking space around around archive and archive use. And there's a lot of protocols that we have as First Nations people about images we can show and not show. Um, I have to say that with this film and with a similar, with the film that I did also did recently on the Maralinga people, the experience with the archive was a was a really positive one for this reason. One of the things about the the big archives we have here, so the the National Film and Sound Archive, the National Broadcasters Archive, so a couple of the really big archives that are almost the first go to places for people when they're starting to look for Australian material, um, have not respected the cultural protocols around our community. So one of the things I've found with both of those projects has been that we've been able to find material that's very personal to the community that the community did not know existed. So it's been a lovely part of the filmmaking process when we're sharing stories. And so particularly with the Armadale community, um, who are obviously a very central thread to the story, being able to find that archive and then be able to identify with the help of the community people that we're working with who was in that archive to then be able to have that archive labelled in a way that then identifies the people who should be uh, able to give permission to have that archive used. So there's a repatriation that goes on as part of that process because these archives have been done in such a colonial way and against community protocols. Um, and being able to return that material to people has been a very important part of them being able to be the true custodians of their own stories. So, um, you know, I think it's a very interesting element that we can be doing as filmmakers in terms of that process of archiving. So in, in making these kind of films now, I'm always making sure that when we go into them, we're kind of budgeting to ensure that the archive that we're finding is being converted back to the community in a way that they can keep in control. So there's a, you know, there, there's a role that we can play when we can get in and find that material. It's often mislabeled or, or it's not easy to search. So if you search for, say, Armadale, you might find something that's very specific to the Anawan community, but it is not labelled that way. So if you went to to look just for that, you wouldn't find it. Wow. Um, wow, I actually wasn't expecting uh, <laughs> how much of it is not. I, I was expecting something much more uh, direct when it comes to how these things are regulated, but it's, but, uh, you know, when it comes to these forms of labelling and, and creating these systems of knowledge, uh, it's as if, uh, you know, we're not going to make it uh, impossible to find, but it's going to be quite difficult. And and it takes a certain level of persistence to do so. Um, wow, really, really complicated. Um, so uh, I want to move on to the question of, you know, the very subject of your film itself. And it starts off with this question about why, in particular, the Australian national uh, rugby team has seemed inferior when it comes to its uh, inclusion of cultural practices, uh, especially when it comes to the pre, um, I guess, game dances and, and whatnot. Um, now, I guess I'm trying to understand why, um, why is it, is this, why is, was that a particular issue with Australia and, and why other nations seem to have been able to um, bridge that gap much faster? Uh, does it, I mean, is it even a false thing to even say, like, am I probably ignoring the histories of these other teams and maybe they've gone through something similar? So No, um, no, it's, it's a very insightful question and it, yeah. it, it's a great question because actually I think for us, when, when Dean and I were looking at the story and how to tell it, there is a certain element there that is about, uh, you know, when you ask the question, why, why is it that Australian teams have been so resistant to... Um, adopting a Aboriginal cultural um, stance the way that other national teams around the Pacific had done to, to incorporate their own First Nations cultures, there, there is certainly an element of um, there being an entrenched resistance to that. Um, it, part of it would have been just not as a, a the 
dominant culture making space for First Nations cultures. That's been a very slow progress. And we see moments like when Sydney hosted the 2000 Olympics. Of course, the first thing that comes out when Australia shows itself to the world is ab an, an Aboriginal dance, Aboriginal dancers. So there'd been a sort of sense of knowing that that's what we show to the world, but people didn't have it in their hearts. And now I think it's become quite complicated. You have people who don't have it in their hearts, so don't want to do it, they don't respect it. Uh, but you also have people that highly respect it but are so unused to engaging with it that they are very scared of getting it wrong. And I think that very much describes the experience that we see with the uh, the coach who talks about his attempt to to do something that wasn't actually really didn't embrace the whole thing it just took bits of it which was its own problematic but he came from a place of good but not wanting to offend people and being unsure of that um he's a south sea islander so not first nations to australia and was probably highly sen sensitive about that so there, there is either a, a you know the the colonial racism of not wanting to embrace it and when people do because it's so little engaged with in some ways in Australia um, not feeling a confidence about that so what we've seen in terms of how much it has increased is I, I don't think it's any coincidence that when we start to see the uh, introduction of a First Nations led dance is when we have the first all Indigenous team with the All-Stars. Once you start to get that critical mass at that level, um, there's, a, there's a better ability for those players to, as a cohort, start to work together across their various teams, uh, but coming together to make these quite significant changes. So that's kind of the first dynamic that I think is there. Um, I think there's a more subtle and interesting dynamic that we see our players go on, you know, it's very easy in one way to think about this as the, the First Nations culture of Australia versus the dominant culture. But I think for the men, they're, they're wanting to have something that it displayed their culture, came from standing on a field and having, say, a haka perform to them and not having something to answer to it. And so there was a big part of it that was really about thinking about the difference between our culture here and the cultures of the Pacific and a way of realising that we are so entwined with our history and have such great relationships and there's a real synergy of experience. But at the heart of it, Aboriginal culture is a 65,000 plus year culture. So it's a much older culture than our Pacific brothers and sisters um, in terms of their, their culture. And, and in a way, it was understanding we're not a Polynesian culture. And that was important for us to understand that we had to do something that embraced our culture and was proud of who we are rather than trying to emulate the elements of a Polynesian culture. So it wasn't enough. You hear, you hear one of the uncles say in his own way, don't do the, 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 the warrior thing, which meant, you know, the haka because that's not who we are, we hunt quietly. And I think it has been a real challenge for First Nations people in Australia who see a very demonstrative and, um, you know, and, and engaging um, First Nations cultures and our culture is very different. So having to find a way to incorporate that, a culture where the silence is more important than the words mm. And Dean used to, Dean and I used to say, it's almost like trying to understand that we are an old man of 65,000 years and we are having a conversation with a young man and that's going to feel different. So we can't talk like a young man. We have to embrace what the old man would be like, the older man. And I think when they did that, there was a, so in a way that the, 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 the other cultures around the Pacific helped our men understand their own, own culture and embrace it more by having to think really deeply about what how to express that with with faithfulness rather than just meeting what they were what they were seeing on the field and I think at the end of the day it's a beautiful there's a beautiful element of 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 it not being we're fighting you 
but we are meeting you as equals and embracing you. So that bit at the end where they actually embrace the Maori tradition of coming up and hugging the player on the other team as opposed to doing a war dance and then, okay, we're off to play the, the warlike game of team against team. There's, a, I think, a much more First Nations value or a First Nations approach to saying that actually at the end of our, our display of both of our culture, it's about us telling you who we are and then us coming together as equals and really respecting and showing love for each other. And now let's get on and play the game. Oh wow! Um, I'm 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 completely I'm blown away by everything that you just shared because, uh, you know, it's very difficult. The first instinct that we have when it comes to things around culture, I'd say, it's maybe in the current times especially, is this is what it should be, right? Um, and and it's an interesting question of even in the beginning is shouldn't every team that's competing in rugby have its own war dance so that it can demonstrate this thing? And and I like I think you've thrown another wrench in the gears and it just makes us think well is that even the proper way to represent um, Australia and to, and the way that you regard the history. And I love that metaphor of just um, an older person talking to a bunch of, you know, teen I mean, that's arguably even problematic in its own way, but like, <laughs> but yeah. in a way um, I want to, I'm almost trying to like to sidestep the question of um, whether it's problematic. And that, at the very least, that's an interesting take, right? Uh, I mean, it's an interesting way to think about, um, sometimes it doesn't have to be demonstrated through yelling and dance, but through silence and through austerity and through a quiet resignation, which is just as brooding as well. Um, well, that's the right. And there's obviously a lot of things that youth and energy do that are important and exciting. So it's sure. not about saying one's better than the other. Right. It's about acknowledging who you are. And we do find that when we take young students particularly over to, to New Zealand and they are met uh, by in a traditional Maori way, they can feel like that they're, you know, while they're incredibly welcomed, they feel like they need to do something that is just at, is cultural in the same way as Maori are. And we have to say to them, that's not our way. You can't meet them with something that's not true to you. You have to show them who we are. And if our culture is quieter, that doesn't mean it's not as vibrant or or real, it just means that we're different and you have to embrace that difference. So, you know, and you look at how strong and and you know you know impressive those those harkers are, you can see why people who, you know, aren't deeply connected to their culture could feel like that's what we've got to be like. And and really the cultural journey here for people has been to reconnect and find where our cultural difference lies. And yeah, it's, as you say, it's not about, um, you know, if the metaphor is clumsy, it's certainly not about saying it's that one is better than the other. Both bring an enormous amount together and we can't have a community unless we've got young people and old people. We all have a role to play, but it's really about, find, about being truthful to who you are and not trying to emulate something that you're not. Absolutely, I love that. Um... Uh, I mean, and that pursuit of authenticity is such a challenging pursuit, but such a worthwhile one as well, right? Um, yeah. My next question for you is uh, a tricky one. It's about, um, you know, and I think we've started to scratch the surface of it is, you know, these are very sensitive um, issues when being expressed through what seems to be innocuous, but I think digs very deep into such a complicated yet rich history for all these peoples that are involved. Um, and, you know, inevitably there have to have been some times where people got uncomfortable talking about this or thinking about this. And, uh, you know, with explorations of racism come explorations of trauma that spans ge generations, centuries, millennia in this case. Um, did you have those kinds of experiences while making this film, not just personally, but like with your subjects or uh, with um, anyone that's been, was involved in the, in the, in the journey of making it? Yeah, look, that's a really a really great question, and I guess as a filmmaker, you 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 have to do a lot of work going in before you even start to get people to tell the story because the trauma, as you say, is is quite real. And other films I've made have dealt with Aboriginal families who've been victims of crime and been unable to get justice for murdered children. They've been about people who've had their children taken away from them in the contemporary child removal. Um, system. And so there is, you, 
there's a very visible trauma around that. And it might, in some ways, you can lull yourself into thinking, well, because this is a about a dance and it's about footballers, there's a level of resilience there. I don't think you can you can make that assumption. And in going into to any of these kind of uh, tellings of these stories, you have to be really aware that the, the triggering of telling a story can also cause trauma. And I think it's part of our responsibility as storytellers to, first of all, make sure that we're not picking people who are highly vulnerable when it's not the right time for them to tell their stories. So you have to do a bit of work on that. And even the most seemingly resilient person, you can never assume that they're not carrying trauma or that the process of talking about something is going to be difficult for them. So there's a lot that needs to be done in terms of how you build the trust with them to be able to be really honest and have that continuing care to make sure they're, they're happy with how the interview and engagement with the process of making the film has been. But also, you know, I think incredibly importantly, it's one thing to, to, to sit down one-on-one -on -one and tell some tell somebody your story to camera. It's a very different thing when you see yourself on film and other people see you. And it's almost like if you just think that the issues around dealing with the what the impact of the process might be while you're making the film and someone's telling you their story and it might be difficult, you kind of not even helping them deal with the, the biggest impact, which is other people hearing that story. So as a filmmaker, I think your responsibility is kind of for the life of the story. Uh, people I've made films with on those other issues are people that I still keep in contact with because I feel like the relationship's strong, so I need to know if anything has come up or continues to come up. So it's not a just, you know, get your story and, and go out. We, we wouldn't do that as First Nations storytellers anyway. I think we understand, given how important storytelling is as part of our culture, that when someone tells you their story, they're giving you a gift and you have such a responsibility to care for it. Um, and, and look, you know, it can surprise you. I'd surprise Dean when Dean has his conversations with his dad. He said to me later, his dad told him things about his experience as an Aboriginal man in a really racist town that he hadn't shared before. It was very, it was actually very emotional for Dean as much as it was for his father. And, and I guess the other thing I'd say is, um, you know, it's important to think about the, the, the framework of trauma and support, but it's also important to know that one of the most important things that you can give people who have been disempowered is their voice back and their chance to tell their story their own way. So I think part of ensuring people can manage the trauma and have it as a, an empowering and cathartic experience is to work very closely with them to ensure you are telling their story in an authentic way. In some ways, I think that responsibility becomes even more apparent in the edit than when you're just filming with somebody and they're talking to you, when you're making choices about what you're putting in and what you're putting out. I find that that's a point where I really need co to be collaborative with that person because I don't want to make a decision about what parts of their story are important or not. And I think that's another thing about First Nations storytelling. When someone tells us our story and we talk about responsibility, it's not enough for us to take the bits of what they've told us and, and mould it into the story we want to tell. We have to listen to what their story is and as storytellers make sure that what they've said when it comes out in an edited f version on film is the way they've told it so you have the integrity of their story and that's really where the skill is. And the more you can be true to their voice and what they've wanted to share and say, then the more I think you are ensuring that the experience is going to be one that's empowering for them. And I guess the only other thing I'd add to that is it does really make a difference in terms of who that person is. So, for example, I was recently a producer on a film I'm very proud of called In My Blood It Runs. The main the main character in that story is a 12-year-old boy from Alice Springs. And obviously there was an enormous responsibility in terms of being able to support a young, young man 
um, telling his story and having that go to the world. Um, and so, there, you know, that that was something where we worked really closely with him and the family and we continue to manage to this day to ensure that he continues to feel that has been an empowering process for him. It was a vehicle for him to go and actually be the youngest person to present at one of the forums at the UN. So it's been a wonderful thing for him, but that just didn't happen because the film was there. It happened because we really seriously thought about how do we put, um, you know, the arms around him uh, as a subject of a documentary once his story goes out into the world. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's wonderful how deeply ethically you think about your work and uh, and that I think there was a moment you mentioned that uh, you're more concerned about the relationship with the subject than whatever um, question or maybe uh, uh, like something that might be good in the film is not nearly as important as that. And especially, I mean, yeah, given the subject matter itself, that is truly fitting to say the least. Uh, that, you know, uh, I mean, it, it seems like it's surrounded by things like sports and entertainment, um, but underneath that are such deeper layers that really ask a lot about our own humanity. Um, Larissa, my last question for you, um, almost to the end, amazingly. Oh. <laughs> uh, what? Uh, so, you know, right now I wanted to just kind of take it back and think broadly about uh, what is next for this community um, as they continue to fight for equality and dignity and respect um, on their field and beyond. Uh, you know, your film makes a great case for uh, the, the work that they've done so far, but what what do you see um, happening next for them? Well, I think very much that they're looking at using this as a, um, as a springboard to uh, further push the embrace of, of this as a, as a, a recognised cultural ceremony. Um, you know, I think one of the interesting things about the, the journey that Dean went on with this um, is that when we first started making the film, the main goal was to get the Australian team to do this dance. That was his goal. And then COVID hit, there's no football, there's no, there's no test. <laughs> um, and it was a it was the moment where I think the film actually went from being a, a, a nice account of, of a slice of our culture to something really profound. When you saw people like Dean who defined themselves by football, you know, you'd say to him, why do you want to do this dance? Why is it so important? Because football's given me everything. I want to give back to football, 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 football. When the pandemic hit, Dean lost not only his job with the NRL, with the National Rugby League, he lost two sports commentating jobs and two coaching jobs. So his whole world in, in a week just went. And through that time, obviously he speaks about this in the film, he came through that and realised that actually it was never football that made him strong but his culture. And, and, and what I love about him, and particularly when we talk about why, why are young people such an important part of the community, you know, what, why is it, you know, why is it not a negative to say somebody's the young culture? He, ha I could see this new generation of players coming through like Cody Walker and Latrell, who were so comfortable with their identity and was so outspoken about standing up to racism in a way that Dean in his generation would never dare to have done. I could see how his interaction with those young players, such great role models, really good men, changed Dean. And so by the end of the film, he he stops begging people to do his dance. He no longer saw that what he needed to do was to keep asking, please do the dance at the test. He's he took it in a completely different direction with the confidence of doing it in his own space and knowing others would just follow because of the strength of of the leadership of the men who were doing it. And I thought that was a very significant thing. So when you ask me about where to from here, I'm not sure that's an easy answer. I think what Dean would say is, you know, now we wanna keep going and making the dance roll out. But I think that really underplays 
where he is in his journey um, for what next. Mm -hmm. There's a bit in the film that's my one of my favourites. Um, I would say my favourite scene in the film is the painting up scene before the performance. I think it's one of the most beautiful lyrical things I've ever had the privilege to film, and I love it. But my second favourite was a very personal favourite, which many audiences probably wouldn't see the same way I do. But it's in the lead up to the dance. It has Dean with Stephen Page, who's the artistic director of Bangara, our big national da Indigenous dance theatre, and Wesley Enoch, who's another one of our really important cultural figures, who's been um, one of our most famous theatre directors and was and was the director of uh, the Sydney Festival uh, for the year the boys did the dance there. And they are walking up this hill together. And now these are three men who are the same age as me and I've known um, Stephen and, and um, Wesley since I was a teenager. It was probably when we first got to know each other. So a very long journey. And at that moment, I could see those three men. I still get a bit teary when I think about it, that I've known all my life. And I could see them thinking about legacy and what I felt was almost the beginning of the start of their eldership. And I see that for Dean too. So when you ask me about what's the next step, I I kind of think for Dean, it's actually going to be more in that cultural leadership space than the dance. I think the dance was really just something that helped him find his bigger pathway. Um, th I think that's a beautiful way to really summarize a lot of what we've discussed today. And, uh, you know, it's it's difficult when so much of people's identities are caught up in things like sports and entertainment, even though the shelf life for people to participate is relatively short. Um, and many people ask what's next. Uh, I think you summarize it best where uh, it's not, you know, being the athlete uh, that is part of their strength, but it, it's their community, it's their culture. And that's the thing that has, that lasts beyond people's lifespans. Um, and I find that in that way alone, that's why the subject matter of what your film is, is so important because uh, it really isn't about, you know, who wins or loses or who's the greatest, best athlete out there. It's about the way in which we conduct ourselves respectfully, right? Um, so that I think is just, lovely and beautiful um larissa that's the end of our q a thank you so oh, much for I taking the so time enjoyed our chat. thank you I, I i thoroughly enjoyed this as well and um i want to thank you i want to thank your team i also want to thank everybody who's been who actually took the time to watch this uh this was absolutely a pleasure on my end and a special mahalo for all of our hif sponsors our board of directors and our HIF Ohana members. Thank you so much for supporting this. Also, for if you're watching, if you're able, please consider donating to the Hawaii International Film Festival. Every dollar counts towards HIF's effort to pre present more great content just like this in the future. Uh, you can learn more and donate at hif.org slash donate. So thank you so much for watching and mahalo. Bye-bye now.